Mr. Varun Deshpande is Managing Director of the Good Food Institute India. As the son of a cancer surgeon from Mumbai, Varun has been deeply immersed in healthcare and technology from a very young age. He spent several formative years studying chemical and biomedical engineering at technology hub Carnegie Mellon University. He then went on to work to implementing digital health in India and the United States, helping vulnerable populations through care coordination and a systems approach to healthcare. Whilst in the United States, Varun learned about effective altruism, a philosophy which seeks to investigate and target the world's most pressing problems. He came to understand the tremendous impact of industrial animal agriculture on the world and the imperative need to transition away from its using markets and technology in dedicating his work to the future of protein and combining his duty to human and planetary health. Varun aims to help build a more healthy, sustainable, and just global food system starting right here in India. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a very warm round of applause to Mr. Varun Deshpande, Managing Director, GFI India. He will talk about the sector overview, the why, what, and how of new protein. Over to you. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes? OK, wonderful. All right, so as that introduction said, uh, my name is Varun Deshpande. I'm the Managing Director for India at the Good Food Institute. Um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the sector of new protein or alternative protein. So at the Good Food Institute and in the new protein sector in general, the big sort of zoomed out question we all focus on is this one. How do we feed nearly 10 billion people by the year 2050 through systems which don't have negative implications on planetary health, scarce natural resources, biodiversity, antimicrobial resistance, public health. Honestly, pick your reason, right? But before we talk about the future of food, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the world is today. Having an efficient food system, we know, is particularly important in our part of the world because we have severe challenges. We have challenges that affect us very deeply. They affect the population, the health, and the security of our nation, as well as the region of Asia in general. So if you look at some of the questions that we have to grapple with in India, the highest cohort rates of malnutrition, of iron deficiency, anemia, of folic acid deficiency, of all of these problems, protein, energy, malnutrition, uh, it becomes incredibly urgent and imperative for us to think about these questions and how we transition our food systems to be much more efficient and to be more inclusive. One of the things that's really indicative of how the future might evolve is looking at the past of technology. So let me do a quick poll. I know we're doing this on Slido, but I'll just take a show of hands right now. Um, how many of you have diabetes or know people who have diabetes? This is the, uh, yeah, there we go, diabetes capital of the world. Um, yeah, so many people in this room know people who have diabetes. What we probably don't know is how we used to treat diabetes. So right up until the 1980s, the world used to treat diabetes with insulin taken from animals, namely pigs and other animals. So we used to harvest insulin from the pancreases of pigs and then transform that, purify it, and use it to treat diabetes in humans. So Eli Lilly, which is one American pharmaceutical company, used to buy the pancreases of 53 million animals every year to manufacture insulin. So you can imagine these like pinkish blobs loaded onto train carriages just going to this processing facility outside Indianapolis, right? It used to take 23,500 pounds by weight of pancreases to get one pound of purified insulin. That's how inefficient it was. And the world was constantly at danger of running out of insulin. So something had to change, and it did. And usually what happens when we're faced with these kinds of problems is technology comes to the fore, driven by ingenuity and that scarcity. So what happened is a company named Genentech figured out how to make human insulin, not pig insulin, uh, through a technology process. And now all over the world, we use human insulin that's made in a manufacturing process, not harvested from pigs. It's much more efficient, and it's much better for the security and the health security of our world. And that facility from Eli Lilly, the company in the United States, is now a parking garage for a much larger facility that manufactures insulin. So going back to that big zoomed out question, how do we feed 9.7 billion people over one-sixth of whom are going to be in India 
over 60% of whom are going to be in Asia, over 80% of whom are going to be in Asia and Africa by 2050. Unfortunately, we don't really have a very efficient food system, and it's not going to help us do this if we continue with business as usual. So if you'll forgive the numbers for a second, just under one third of the world is land. About 70% of that is habitable. Half of that habitable land is already used for agriculture. And the rest of it is our dwindling forests and our shrublands. And I say dwindling because I think you've seen that the Amazon has been on fire recently for weeks on end. Much of the reason for those things happening, and this is happening in our region as well, it's happening in Indonesia, it's happening all over the world, much of the reason for that happening is because we need more grazing land, we need more land to grow crops. Over three-fourths of agricultural land is already used to raise livestock. And out of all that land, all those inputs, we only get one-third of the world's supply of protein. So why is this happening? Why do we have this somewhat crazy equation to get these foods? And the reason is really simple. We grow crops, we feed them to animals, and then we eat a portion of those animals as food. So the chicken which you're seeing here, which has been relentlessly optimized using advanced breeding techniques over many generations in the most efficient food systems, like factory farming systems in the United States, it still takes in nine calories of input to give you one calorie of output in the form of flesh. So I wasn't, I know that introduction said I studied at Carnegie Mellon, I wasn't a very good engineer. I would struggle to design a worse system than this. And in fact, chickens, if you look at this, are a case study in how we should think about food waste. Because we all talk about food waste as being a very urgent problem, and it is. Something like 40% of India's fruit and veg is wasted in the supply chain because we don't have cold chain infrastructure, and that's a huge problem. Uh, we need to get more efficient about that. We absolutely do. But there's a lot of attention on that problem right now, and I believe that it will get incrementally better. What about this other problem? What about this 800% waste that's going into animal production? Nine calories in, one calorie out. And it gets even worse because chickens are actually among the most efficient animals. So pigs are worse. Cows are way, way worse than that. Fish are slightly better depending on the fish. But fish have all sorts of problems. So there was a, a piece of news recently that a company in Canada called Northern Harvest Sea Farms, and we're going to be talking a lot about seafood during the course of this conference. Northern Harvest Sea Farms last month lost 5,000 metric tons of Atlantic salmon. That's 2.5 million salmon in their aquaculture operations because of a rise in water temperature. Aquaculture is when you farm fish off the coast. So in Fortune Bay in Canada, 2.5 million dead Atlantic salmon that took them two months to fish up, to get out of the water. It was 50% of their entire operations in the water. So even if you look at, whether you look at it from a efficiency standpoint or a security standpoint, we're looking at really poor protein production platforms because they're living, breathing organisms, just like you and I. And it's not just the efficiency and the security argument, right? So all that land, all that water, all those crops we're growing, they're incredibly hard on the environment. This is why chickens emit 40 times more carbon dioxide per calorie of protein than lentils. The industrial animal agriculture ecosystem, which India is rapidly moving towards industrialization on the supply side, it contributes more to climate change than all emissions from all transport on the earth combined. So all trains, cars, automobiles, everything you can think of. This is why United Nations scientists say that animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to the world's most pressing climate problems, big or small, local or large. And of course, the issues of antibiotic use in the animal supply chain are no secret. Um, I need only point to some of the headlines coming out of China right now about African swine fever, where one third of a nation's entire pig population is being decimated by African swine fever. The reason for this is very simple. So we take a bunch of antibiotics, and we grow animals, and we need to keep those animals well. So we give those antibiotics to animals. Something like 70 to 80% of antibiotics in India, and over 80% of antibiotics in the United States, are fed to animals. And I think we all have spoken to doctors and said, hey, we have a cold, should we take an antibiotic? And the doctor says, 
I mean, it's a risk. Because at some point, you get resistant to those antibiotics, and that's how you breed superbugs. Now, none of this stuff I'm saying is a secret to anyone here, right? It's just that over the last decades, and especially over the last couple of years, all of these implications are becoming increasingly well-known to us in this room and to the people out there in the, in the world. So pick your reason. For me, the problem of industrial animal agriculture and finding alternatives to industrial animal agriculture for producers and for consumers and for governments has been an incredibly pressing question for all of these reasons. And of course, now that I've said all of this, anyone who eats meat in the crowd here today is just going to go home and stop eating meat, and it's all going to be great, right? That's, that's just not true, and it's evidenced by the fact that global meat consumption is on the rise, despite everything I just said, and despite its increasing awareness in the population. So the, the world is eating more meat than ever before, despite all of those things. And in fact, if you look at the rise in demand over the next decade, and by 2050, India, Southeast Asia, China, countries which have been constrained by supply and income up until this exact point, are the ones that are actually contributing to that rise in consumption. So I mean, the solution to this is very likely not to say, let's ban meat, and let's stop people from producing it, and let's introduce taxes on it, let's do a number of things that have been proposed elsewhere, been tried elsewhere, you know, national guidelines on meat consumption, trying to change the way consumers eat, all of that stuff. The solution is very likely to create products that satisfy consumers and producers on the basis of things that matter to them. So consumers, you and I, we care about taste, we care about price, we care about convenience, we care about health, we care about all of these things. And that's what we should be doing, is making products that satisfy exactly what consumers want on those bases. We're going to be talking about the new protein sector over the next couple of days, and that involves a number of technologies and a number of categories of food. But the two big hero categories that have emerged over the, over the world over the last couple of years have been what's known as plant-based meat, and cultivated meat. So plant-based meat is a product that's made from crops or made from plant ingredients, but which has that inherent sensory experience of meat. So it feels like a simple switch. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice, because what you're getting is chicken, or what you're getting is beef, if you're eating in the United States, where they eat a lot of beef. And the world has already sat up and taken notice. I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock not to have noticed that Beyond Meat went public, and it's, it's, my phone has been ringing off the hook. In the, in the month after Beyond Meat went public, I got more phone calls than I had in the six months prior combined, right? If you look at any of the, the big chains around the world, so McDonald's is gonna be doing something in this area pretty soon. Burger King in the US has uh, already been doing extremely well from its impossible Whopper. And this is the product that I'm talking about. So this is an impossible burger. Uh, it's what Americans like to eat. Um, Americans eat three burgers a week, which I love America for all sorts of reasons. That's kind of crazy. But um, the impossible burger is a product that is so meat-like that it won the best of the best award at the Consumer Electronics Show this past year. So a show that's normally reserved or an award that's normally reserved for the newest TVs, telephones, this roll-up TV, this waterproof speaker, all of that stuff. This burger is the hottest new technology at that show. They served it at Davos last year, and when I went and met the government of India and other people within the government of India, they had already seen it the week prior at Davos, which made my job incredibly easy. And what's really exciting in this area is that we've only scratched the surface, right? So internationally, the hero product has been burgers, which is great. But in India, it won't necessarily be burgers, and that's what we're going to be talking about a lot. In Asia, in India, it's not necessarily going to be burgers. It's going to be your delicious keema. Uh, it might be chicken tikka. It might be biryanis. It might be all sorts of products that perform really well for the Indian palate, or even other products that perform well for the Southeast Asian palate. And what we can do today, we're lucky to be alive at this exact moment in history, because what we can do today with technology is much more than what we could do 10 years ago. And finally, What's really important to me personally and to us as an organization is that these products might be great and they're doing extremely well with consumers. Behind the scenes, they're actually catalyzing a revolution. So the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger, which are the two biggest companies in this sector, they actually use orders of magnitude less land, water, non-renewable energy, emit much less 
greenhouse gases than their conventional animal counterparts, which is why they received an award last year from the UN called the Champions of the Earth Award. And the, in the political category, the other person who received this award, you might recognize him, his name is Mr. Narendra Modi. So at the same time that our Prime Minister received a Climate Action Award, a Champions of the Earth Award from the UN, so did these two companies. The other category of food that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days is called cultivated meat, which is quite simply taking cells from an animal, and instead of that really intensive process I mentioned earlier of growing crops, growing the animal, transporting the animal, et cetera, et cetera, you just grow those cells directly. So it's like farming cells instead of farming the animal and slaughtering them. And it's been called many things. So it's been called clean meat because it's quite literally cleaner. You don't have animal waste, and it's cleaner for the environment. It's kind of like clean energy. It's also been called cultured meat. It's also been called in vitro meat, lots of things. But cultivated meat is what the industry is converging on. It's basically, as I say, a product that's made from cultivating cells and farming them instead of farming the animal. You're cutting out the middle animal, as it were. And this is what it looks like at scale, by the way. I don't know if, you, if any of you recognize this, but it's the production system for a product many of us know and love, which is called beer. And this is what that looks like, and this is what cultivated meat will look like at scale. To give you a sense of what's been happening in that sector, so in 2013, a doctor, Mark Post in the Netherlands, uh, grew and ate a lamb burger. He cooked it live on TV and ate it for the first time in history. Uh, and that research project cost $330,000. So they dubbed it the $330,000 lamb burger, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that same professor, Mark Post, has a company called Mosa Meat on the bottom left there, which is currently commercializing, accelerating the market. And they have an internal cost basis of roughly $10 now, six years later. And this was the commercial landscape in this area at the end of 2016. A gentleman named Dr. Uma Valetti, uh, who was born in Vijayawada in Andhra Pradesh, went to the US and he studied cardiology. Uh, he was president of the All-American Medical Association or Association of Cardiologists, if I'm not mistaken. And he's a Mayo Clinic trained surgeon. Um, and he decided to take the learnings that he had received in renewable, sorry, excuse me, in regenerative medicine and apply them in this area. So he started the first company, in fact, in this sector called Memphis Meats. And in 2016, they debuted the world's first cultivated meatball. So this is a Memphis Meats meatball in 2016. And at the end of 2016, as I mentioned, there were those four companies. This is what it looked like at the end of 2018. And if I had the additional circle for the end of 2019, you would see that there are 40 plus companies now that are working on this problem. And we actually have a company in India called Clear Meat, who, which is here during this conference. We have a company in Singapore called Shiok Meats. Uh, we have a lot of companies in Israel, and Dr. Ron Malka, His Excellency, from the, the ambassador to, uh, to New Delhi from Israel, is going to be talking about the Israeli uh, primacy in this sector. This is a Shiok Meats shrimp dumpling that was debuted earlier this year, which is made entirely from cultured shrimp cells. They're a Singapore-based company, but their founders are Indian. And this is what happens when you apply technology to a really complex problem. So as I was saying earlier, the first uh, lamb burger that was grown from cells cost $330,000. Here's an example of how this might evolve over time. And it's already happening in cultivated meat, right? As I say, that company's already driven down the price. This is a graph of the cost of genome sequencing. When we did the first human genome sequencing at the beginning of the 2000s, it cost roughly $3.1 billion to have that project be done. And at the time, every additional genome cost $100 million. And now you and I can go to any of the competing startups and buy a whole genome for roughly $100. And I think in a few years, it'll be in the tens. This is what happens when you apply technology to a problem, as I was saying with insulin earlier, and you increase competition, use markets, and drive down the cost. But I think the important question that we've all come here to to really examine over the next couple of days is where India stands in all of this. Because all, a lot of what I'm describing has happened elsewhere, and in fact, many Indian founders have gone elsewhere, many Indian entrepreneurs have gone elsewhere and founded companies. So what does it mean for the Indian ecosystem and how can we stimulate it? So as I said earlier, it might not be burgers. 
I think maybe for urban, upwardly mobile people who are interested in eating Western once or twice a week, it might be burgers, but it might not be three times a week for everyone across the country, which as I say is a little insane for all, all sorts of reasons. Uh, we have to figure out ways of localizing to the Indian palate, to the Indian context. And we're very excited that we're going to be talking about a lot of this stuff over the next couple of days. So we have companies presenting original consumer research on how Indians might respond to plant-based meat and plant protein in general. What we think can happen on the markets and business side is we can have a thriving ecosystem moving forward, dozens of companies being founded every year that are making really great products, that are competing in the marketplace, and that are showing that Indians are really interested in consuming meat just made a different way, or milk just made a different way, or eggs just made a different way. And this would not have been pro possible last year. When we did the Future of Protein Summit, the first edition on August 24th last year, we weren't sure at the Good Food Institute India, which was just me at the time, so I was managing director of myself. Um, I wasn't sure how the market would evolve. But standing here today, I can tell you that I'm incredibly optimistic, just from the conversations earlier today, that what's going to happen here is very similar to what's going to happen elsewhere. It's just going to be adapted for the local context. And that includes looking at interesting supply chains. It includes looking at ingredients that are localized. It includes looking at local value chains like pulses and millets. We have a lot of focus on that. We have many speakers who have come in who are global experts on the millet supply chain, the pulses supply chain, the science behind that. And why we want to do that is also to benefit farmers which is an incredibly important group in India and which is currently neglected in terms of how we're dealing with their issues and how we're returning value to them. So creating end-to-end -end value chains and lucrative end markets for those products, whether they're processed pulses or processed millets that can be used as inputs into our sector, or even if it's really specialized ingredients like guar gum or psyllium husk that can go into this sector. That's what we're looking at. And then, one other area where India can contribute in a huge way, and we've already taken a bit of a lead in this, is in R&D. Because markets and R&D are two different things. What companies will do and what companies will fund is going to create tremendous positive consequences for consumers, and it's going to create a market. But when it comes to basic R&D, what we're talking about is incredibly neglected, that rep and that represents a huge opportunity. So if you look at these spheres here, they're the amount of money that was spent on renewable energy in 2011, in one year. Last year, the amount of investment that went into renewable energy globally was $400 billion, with a B. The total amount of money that's gone into this sector, the new protein sector, the meat alternative sector, is less than $2 billion. And that's picking up speed all the time. But if you look at the R&D money within it, it's tiny. So we at the Good Food Institute globally run a competitive grant program of $3 million every year. And that is so small as to be completely negligible when you look at the amount of investment we need. So we're incredibly encouraged that the government of India has taken a leading role in this area. So we have had multiple grants made to cultivated meat. The Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology has received 4.6 crores, that's about $640,000, to cultivate sheep cells and to create a bunch of open access information that companies can take and launch products in the market. Uh, we have a partnership with the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, to set up a research center focused exclusively on this. Uh, and then there are other universities like the Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences that has also received 50 lakhs from the government to look at cultivated meat. And in fact, Mr. Amitabh Kant, who's gonna be here tomorrow, uh, has already recognized that if you free up all this land and all this water by switching from animal-based meat to new protein sources, it could be truly transformative to agriculture, it could be truly transformative to manufacturing industries, and it could be truly transformative to the consumer health. And we can only take a look at what's happened internationally and say that India needs to be there at the forefront of this sector. So if we look at the entire cultivated meat industry, for example, it was formed because of a grant to Dr. Mark Post in 2013. Finally, I just want to close by saying that what is possible today 
our imagination is a little bit constrained by scarcity. So a lot of what we're thinking about right now today is all of this land that's being used, all of this water that's being used, and of course I'm up here telling you that as well. But if we can switch our mindset to being one from scarcity to one of abundance, then we can truly see what's possible in this sector. So I'm now telling you that by 2030 or by 2050, we absolutely can create a supply of affordable, nutritious, great for consumers products that would work for all income levels at all sections of society. That would be exactly what people want to eat, given to them at the price they want, in the form they want. If you want bluefin tuna, which today is a luxury product for $5,000 a pound, I'm saying let's make bluefin tuna for everyone, no matter what section of society you come from. If we apply a technology lens and a scale lens to this, that's what is possible. And that's what we're going to be discussing over the course of the next two days. And I'll leave you with a couple of words about what we think can happen moving forward over the next years. We think we can coalesce a lot of these efforts into a sort of mission for smart protein, where we're looking at seafood, we're looking at sustainable supply chains of millets and pulses, we're looking at different products for the Indian market, and we're looking at taking a global stage and supplying to the world as well. And if we do that, we will probably be able to create the first country in the world, in India, that leapfrogs this protein production system entirely and moves to something that's far more efficient and far more sustainable and better for the world. Thank you.